um, Irka and uh, us three together will go into uh, AI, uh, large language models, uh, specifically in relation to technical writing and documentation. So uh, what we'll dive into is first the benefits of generating your documentation with uh, AI tools, then some disadvantages of doing so, and finally some ways to maybe work around uh, the said disadvantages. Uh, and finally, maybe in the end we will find out whether documentation and AI uh, are a match made in heaven or in hell or maybe somewhere in between. Uh, one important disclaimer before we dive in, uh, given how fast uh, the field of AI is moving, uh, it is not implausible that uh, something monumental happens in a week or in a month, like GPT-5 might come out or the Apple intelligence thing is, is a game changer. And uh, you know, in, it might actually invalidate a big part of what we'll talk about today. Hopefully not, but either way, uh, we wanted to share what we found out uh, in terms of our research, our testing uh, as technical writers, and hopefully it will be informative and helpful to you as well. So, without any further ado, let's dive in. So, uh, technical writing, in essence, is about uh, providing information to people so that they can do things easily and effectively with technology, typically with software in our case. And in the area of providing information, uh, the recent advent of uh, AI tools and large language models has definitely been a big watershed type of moment. Uh, and it's, it's not incomparable, for instance, it's actually very similar to uh, the introduction of search engines back in the 1990s. Uh, to illustrate why, let's take a look at the user experience of getting something done with software with and without the help of a large language model. So, let's say I want to set up SE Linux on RHEL. Now, this is a, an excessively general query, but as an inexperienced user or an administrator, uh, which means uh, as somebody who definitely needs documentation, I might not know that, right? So I ask Google, and Google gives me a long list of various document, documents, articles, blogs, what have you, by different providers, different companies, different people, and I don't really know which one to go with, right? So yeah, let's, let's try the first one, getting started with SE Linux. Uh, that seems, you know, it could be good. No, it, it's, uh, it came first in the search. You know, getting started is, is usually, uh, or setting up is how you get started. And it's by Red Hat, so it must be amazing. So let's take a look. And yeah, it looks like uh, it's actually a conceptual document full of information that gives me some insight into what SE Linux is and how it works and what the backend mechanisms are, but it does not tell me how to set it up. Disappointed face. Now, what to do next? Uh, well, I go back to my Google search and try looking for the next best thing. Uh, I'll see what, what other documents there are. Maybe one of them will eventually help me get my job done. Uh, and if not, well, uh, I'll probably ask for a stack uh, on Stack Overflow, right, or Reddit. Or, or maybe I'll just give up on, on using SE Linux entirely. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it's not that important anyway, right? <laughs> but, but, uh, maybe this chat GPT thingy could help me get my job done. I've heard it knows a lot. So, I ask my query, uh, I punch it in into, into the chat GPT prompt, and voila! Right away, I have a step-by-step -step guide on how to set up a Linux on RHEL. Uh, it's nicely structured. It has uh, highlighted commands. It even has uh, the copy code function uh, with just a click of a button. Very nifty. And crucially, crucially, I did not have to search through uh, my available resources. Uh, 
I, I did not have to decide which document to go with. I had all I need, presumably, right in front of me right away. So that seems pretty compelling, doesn't it? Now, apparently, uh, it's, it's not very good. I shouldn't probably do my job as a te technical writer from start to finish using ChatGPT. I, I hear it's not good for my employability prospects and, or whatnot. So what can I do uh, as a technical writer, as a professional communicator who wants to relay information in an in a efficient way? Maybe I can, I can use uh, GPT or, or any AI tools, any uh, other large language models to uh, communicate information uh, well. So how do I do it? Well, for instance, I can use AI to create a presentation on AI and documentation. Uh, as it turns out, there is a uh, GPT generator for slide decks, and you just put in a prompt, and boom, here's your presentation. Uh, but don't worry, this is not the slide deck we used. <laughs> Mostly. Uh, but on a slightly more serious note, uh, the process of uh, creating documentation of technical writing mostly boils down to three stages. Um, first, we need to uh, obtain information uh, about what to document. Uh, for instance, uh, we often start with a report uh, that uh, a user or a customer is struggling with something that we should, we should document it better. Uh, or uh, we could have a request to document a new feature or uh, a, a known issue, things like that. Then, of course, to create proper documentation, we uh, want to become experts at the given topic, or as close to experts as possible. So we do a lot of research, a lot of testing, and yeah, I for forgot this, uh, and uh, generally try to get as well acquainted with, with the topic as possible. Uh, then, after we have the background information we need, we refine it. Uh, in a way that makes it uh, as helpful and is as impactful as possible. So generally, we write in a way that makes the content uh, easy to find, easy to read, and effective when it's put into action. Uh, and of course, we have a lot of reviews uh, done by various stakeholders, subject matter experts, other writers, and generally try to get it as fine-tuned as possible. And Finally, when it's ready, we unleash our content onto the world, uh, make it available somewhere on the internet uh, as, as guides, or maybe uh, we get it integrated into the product itself uh, so that it's sort of a seamless part of the UX. Now, in theory, uh, in each of these phases of technical writing, uh, AI tools can be very resourceful collaborators for us. So in the first phase, uh, we as technical writers are basically just like anybody else asking uh, an LLM for, for information. Uh, we can ask what something is, what it does, uh, or, or uh, how, how does it work, or maybe uh, what a particularly obtuse piece of code actually does. Uh, and uh, yeah, an AI tool can be very helpful in um, all these uh, requirements. Then, uh, when we proceed to actually refining the information, uh, AI can help us brainstorm various ways of, of wording uh, our, our uh, headings or anything else, basically. Uh, though headings are especially important for, for many various reasons. Uh, also, uh, we can use AI tools to help us create uh, scripts or, or commands or any code to complement the instructions uh, uh, that, that we write, and we can also use AI, for instance, to help us restructure some, some big obtuse strings that, that we can't be bothered, or that would be very, very uh, sort of uh, strenuous to, to uh, do by hand. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, uh, we don't have to just take from the large language model, we can also give back a little bit. Because the thing is, uh, 
large language models uh, uh, generally create queries, or, or rather the answers to queries, uh, primarily based on the statistical occurrence of strings together uh, in, in uh, their data sets. And that means that if you make your documentation uh, publicly available and it's uh, easy to find and it helps people, uh, then uh, it is more likely to uh, be quoted by other sources, right? And that means that you are increasing the probability that a large language model that is trained on uh, the data set of the internet will use your documentation as its data set and, and create uh, answers based on your content. So all in all, uh, you can use uh, AI tools, large language models specifically, to uh, well ge generate ready-made documentation instantaneously, or handcraft your own uh, documentation uh, with some help, and it also allows you to give back to uh, the entirety of the internet in, in the uh, basically in the spirit of open source, right, uh, and uh, help other uh, users with their future uh, uh, queries and. Uh, in the accuracy of the answers they get. So that still all sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? Probably, yeah, I see some nodding. Uh, let's, let's do uh, questions and answer afterwards, all right? Uh, yeah, I, I probably hasn't, haven't mentioned it. Uh, if we miss something, uh, please, uh, we'll, we'll be happy if you share your, your tips and insights at, at the end. So, sorry about uh, uh, missing that. Anyway, so, uh, but so far it, it looks pretty, pretty cool for, in terms of docs and AI. But uh, Robert here has been giving me some meaningful looks uh, when I was talking, but so, so I think that he probably has something to add on that topic. So in this part, I'm gonna be talking about some of the considerations that need to be taken into account when working with content generated by AI or LLMs. Uh, and uh, I have tried to summarize these concerns or considerations into a set of questions. Uh, and just to be clear, these questions are something that any technical writer or creator of documentation would need to be asking themselves anyway before publishing or making content available. However, in the case of AI-generated content, the reasoning behind the questions and, and therefore the considerations are slightly different. So let's take a look at them one by one and uh, also on the things that need to be uh, taken into account as the mitigation measures. So first and probably the most obvious question to ask is, is it factual? Because documentation obviously needs to be based on facts. It needs to reflect reality. And uh, just like Yurka mentioned before, uh, a large part uh, of the equation is how much is uh, the, in the training data set. Uh, if uh, the data is uh, of any quality that uh, is being fed into the language model, then chances are that uh, the output is also going to be better. And uh, of course, if you go online and you ask a question of ChatGPT, you have no way of knowing on what it was trained on. And of course, you have no control over the data set that it was trained on. And uh, there are some ways to step around that, such as you can train your language model locally, or you can make use of any of the commercial offerings and uh, train their language model based on the data set that you supply. Uh, but the thing is, uh, due to the nature of um, LLMs and how they work, uh, you, even if you feed 100% uh, accurate data into the language model, there is no guarantee that the output is also going to be 100% correct. Uh, the language model does not really understand information. It works with patterns, those pat finds those patterns in the data, and then based on that, it generates um, the output. So, you know, there is no direct correlation. It's not deterministic. And also, because it's a natural language processing, a natural language is inherently ambiguous, you cannot be sure that even in the limited understanding of the understanding of a language model, uh, it got the right information. And also, we cannot be sure 
that it understood our query correctly. So there are a lot of unknowns, and you know, probably the basic mitigation measure that applies to all of these questions is to have a human in the loop, uh, just like any technical writer would involve peer review in their process, uh, having somebody to review the information that is being provided by a language model is crucial. And of course, the providers, they know that, so they include disclaimers. Uh, but we need to keep it in mind. Uh, there's another consideration, and that is uh, how up-to-date it is. If you look at uh, OpenAI and what they say about their latest ChatGPT4 model, uh, the cut of data for the training data set is um, more than six months old. If you don't follow the news, you don't, well, know what's new. So the language model also doesn't know. So if there's a new version of software and you ask it to document it, it has no way of knowing about that. Uh, so that's something that, uh, you know, would need to be uh, would need to be considered. Also, as any technical writer, you know, self-respectable technical writer will tell you, uh, the actual writing or creation of documentation is only a smart part um, of the job. Uh, uh, a much larger and usually more time-consuming part is the actual maintenance. Therefore, making sure that the documentation is up to date um, throughout uh, throughout uh, its lifetime, it does not grow obsolete. Of course, we could ask a language model to regenerate content, or we could ask it to update content that was generated previously. But of course, that can only happen after it has been retrained on a data set with the updated information. So something to keep in mind. Moving forward, even if we consider that, or if we, even if we get output that is technically 100% accurate, it does not mean that it was not based on faulty information. So if there are problems or bugs in the code or in the, in the data that was supplied to the language model, uh, we cannot be sure, uh, um, we can be pretty sure actually, that it's going to surface in the output that the language model is going to provide. Also, the data set can be tempered with. It can be, you know, wouldn't be such a bizarre notion to consider that there's something wrong on the internet. Uh, so you know, we need to take that into consideration that uh, the language model only outputs uh, you know, stuff that's as good as what it gets. And finally, in this regard, accountability. Let's say that the documentation that was created by a language model or that came out of it uh, created some problems. It uh, caused damage. Who's going to be held responsible? Is it going to be the creator or of the algor algorithms for the LLM, or is it going to be the person who fed it the data? Ultimately, in the end, it's always going to be the person or the entity who authorized or published the information, um, you know, after all. So, uh, yeah, an important consideration. The other questions can all be sort of summed up after the legality question. Is it legal? Uh, not only can the generated content contain sensitive information or confidential information or you know, customer information, uh, there's also the question of licensing and attribution, you know, copyright in general. We cannot really be sure um, you know, what the data that was consumed by the, by the language model, you know, was it copyrighted or was it licensed in some special way? Um, also, you know, compliance comes into mind, uh, legal uh, considerations such as GDPR. And uh, if, um, you know, as I touched upon before previously, uh, the liability or responsibility, uh, if we take uh, you know, all precautions and we do due diligence and we publish information that was based on content generated by LLMs and uh, it's okay, uh, what about if we do, for example, a chatbot that's based on our documentation? That way we cannot be sure what the generated information is gonna be at any particular moment in time. And it's also going to depend on the queries. So then the liability comes into question. And the ethical considerations, those are, again, um, you know, quite important because uh, due to the generated nature of LLMs, uh, it can do such things as if, if there is a bias involved uh, in the data set, it can amplify that bias. So you know, it's gonna be you know, a bit out of hand. Also, it can uh, you know, output non-inclusive language or things like that <coughs> that it does not really understand. And then there's the question of transparency because, uh, of course, we want to, you know, it's not only attribution, but we want to make sure that uh, if some content is generated by AI, then the person consuming the content would know about that, that there would be a distinction. So all of these questions, none of them are showstoppers, none of them are obstacles that could not be overcome, uh, but they need to be considered and they need to be kept in mind when working with the content that was, you know, that where AI was uh, involved in the generation of it. But over to Dominica, who's gonna talk about uh, some of the practical ways to use uh, LLMs.
Thank you, Robert. So now that we understand uh, <laughs> now that we understand the uh, capabilities and limitations of uh, LLMs, we know we cannot trust uh, whatever they generate. And uh, LLMs uh, are great at generating text uh, that is uh, based on statistical patterns in languages, but they don't understand the information or the context. But they can still help us uh, during the process of creating content. Can consider using them for researching information about new topic. When we get stuck, they can help us to overcome writer's block. If we don't know a piece of content, we don't understand it, we'll just ask them to explain it. A great use case would be to review existing documentation or a draft for grammar or clarity. And they can help us with more, for example, expanding existing content. So uh, we can use existing man pages and, for example, pick the most important information, categorize it, and convert it into a cheat sheet. And there is more. They can help us with uh, to improve ranking of our websites by generating metadata or keywords or just user-friendly URLs and descriptive titles. So also possible to use them for translation. They can quickly translate large amount of documentation. And of course, for all these steps, uh, it's necessary to have a human checking them, verifying the documentation afterwards. And you might ask, why, we, why don't we use LLM to create documentation from scratch? Well, let's try it. So here we have a scenario. We asked GPT to write the procedure how to create LVM snapshot using the snapshot rel system role. That's a collection of Ansible modules and roles. If you ever tried something like this, asking LLM to generate information about a new topic, new technology, you know, this is going to be a failure. But let's not give up. Let's try to improve our prompt and give better instructions. So this is still the same scenario, but um, we provided better instructions, specified the exactly the type of content, um, target audience, and what GPT should give us. So, enter the prompt, and GPT said, certainly, here is a step-by-step -step procedure. And voila, the content looked very appealing at first, very convincing. But when I started reading, I noticed that already the first step is recommending us to use community collection. That's not what we asked for. And additionally, uh, it was nice that there was an example Ansible playbook. But when I look at the content, only the first step of this workflow, which is creating the snapshot, was there as a task. But the remaining parts of the workflow, such as uh, verifying the snapshot creation or mounting the snapshot, were presented as uh, manual steps on the command line. And I work on RHEL, I'm not Ansible expert, but I do question this approach. Is this how Ansible was designed? Is this how developers want us to use Ansible? Is this user friendly? And no, the thing is that when we are creating a procedure, there is way more involved than writing, just like Erika mentioned. It's also about making the decision, what is the, desired way of accomplishing the task. We are not supposed to create alternative, unsupported workflows and send our customers to try them out. But let's give GPT one more chance. So <laughs> we further improved our prompt and asked specifically to remove these manual steps and uh, include them as tasks in the, in the playbook. We also specify a few other things, such as follow our style guide and the templates. Well, guess what? 
at some point, I just started running in circles and so uh, GPT stopped generating any useful or insightful content. And at this point, I was pretty exhausted. I spent all my time on just trying to create the perfect prompt, but I might as well just wrote the documentation by myself. It would take pretty much the same time. And that's because writing is the, the easy part of the job. That's approximately 20% of our time. But the remaining part, such as gathering the information, interviewing our stakeholders, discussing with engineering and support how things should be done, and making those decisions, that's not something we can delegate to LLMs or GPT. So, yeah, they are here just to restructure, refine existing information, but this is a part that requires human input. So creating a new procedure did not work, but let's try a different approach. And that's we moved several steps ahead in our content creation workflow. Uh, we researched the information, we tested the procedure, we have a solid draft, and uh, we are going to ask uh, GPT or LLM to review our documentation and focus on things such as grammar, clarity, the tone of it. And this turned out to be a much better approach. What can help us to get even better results is a good prompt. So what works for me is to provide uh, clear instructions, give context, and uh, define the areas of focus. What can also help is specify target audience and the type of content that we want. And additionally, it's also possible to use any publicly available information, which could be a style guide, it could be our templates, or just supporting existing documentation on the same topic. Platforms like GPT or Gemini are very convenient. You just log in and you can start using them. But uh, in some situations, we might want to go beyond and uh, consider maybe deploying a local LLM on our laptop or on cloud and <coughs> using, for example, Lemma for free, even offline, have un uninterrupted access and uh, also control over the data we enter, which is really important for enterprise technical writers. Um, we can also choose from a variety of the modules, and some of them even led us to contribute to their development. Uh, if um, this is not enough, there is also possibility to go with fine tuning. So imagine you have an existing pre-trained model and you just want to tweak it for your specific needs. So that's when fine-tuning and uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback come into play. Uh, for example, Meta trained the model on uh, let the model answer questions or stack exchange and then used the users to upvote questions based on their relevance and accuracy. And similarly, us writers could uh, fine tune our models and get users feedback on our documentation or documentation chatbots. Uh, there is also possibility of uh, generating more accurate data, not 100% accurate, but more accurate with RAG. That's, uh, Retrieval augmented generation that combines two techniques. Uh, in the first phase, it, uh, it uh, gathers information from an external data source. And in the second generative phase, it augments uh, the prompt and creates the final imp uh, output. Uh, the output can, gen, uh, can include, for example, uh, citations and references to sources, which can make it easier for us to verify the information. Um, now, maybe some of you already 
use LLMs in your documentation workflow. And in that case, we would be really interested in your experience. But first, let me just conclude. Despite GPT going live in November 2022, we still have our jobs. We still write the docs. And that's because LLMs are just tools. They are here to solve some of our problems, but not all of them. They can help us with the writing part, but remember, they are just tools to restructure, refine existing text. They are not here to create new information or documentation. Actually, for them to be effective, they rely on the quality documentation produced by us humans. And I hope we have time for your questions. Okay, so the question is uh, whether Red Hat has thought about creating our own LLM. Yeah, well, we do have a project that is called Instruct Lab, if you have heard about it. <laughs> that uh, is like an open source project that lets people actually contribute to, it, to this development. So you can create a pull request, it's publicly available on GitHub. Yeah, yeah, so the question is whether uh, we tried um, something else than GPT, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or just the, the available like chat platforms, yeah. Uh, I have tried Llama with Maestral and uh, fine tuning it. Um, and for me personally, it was very time consuming and the outcome was not really what I expected. Uh, if we would work with some specific data set, our existing documentation, we might get better results, but in this case it was too generic. And like for me as a writer, I really don't use uh, LLMs to produce docs. And I wanted to add to that, I, I tried to create uh, a model that would have uh, its own data set specified based on uh, um, existing documentation and only that documentation, nothing else. Uh, and arguably, you know, I didn't spend a whole lot of time on that, uh, but uh, the results were abysmal. They were worse than uh, if, uh, you know, the, the specific data set was not, uh, uh, was not specified. Uh, there are various ways to interact uh, with uh, with the endpoints and uh, to, to use the API. I used both a local model as well as uh, the paid model provided by OpenAI, arguably not the other ones. But uh, yeah, uh, basically my conclusion was that uh, you would have to have uh, an enormous data set in order to produce uh, just very small amounts of information. Because even even the non-curated or very little curated data set that is like basically you know the entirety of internet that the regular models use, uh, they still produce better information, better output than if you limit the data set uh, you know only to your stuff that you know that it's true or that's accurate, but uh, the results are yeah it's just bad. 